Oh God, you made us in your own image and you redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion, we pray, on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. amen. That, by the way, some of you I'm, I'm sure are quite familiar with. I, 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 if memory serves, I think it was last night that Presiding Bishop Curry posted that as, as his prayer um, on his uh, website uh, and Facebook page and so forth. But if you're not familiar with it, it's a wonderful prayer to pray every day, perhaps, in these tumultuous times. It's called uh, a prayer for the human family, and it can be found in the Book of Common Prayer. Um, let's see, I didn't, um, don't have my, oh, page 814. Page 814, it's in the section, again, if you're not aware, just a little plug for the wonderful, but not quite as often used or known section of the Book of Common Prayer. Um, that has a section of prayers and thanksgivings. There, there are prayers for almost everything. Um, prayers for rain, which we could offer some of those too. Um, there are prayers for, um, for elections. There are prayers for cities. There are prayers for um, those who are impacted by violence. Prayers for almost everything that you can imagine in that section. So I commend it to you. It's a wonderful section and resource that we have in the Book of Common Prayer. And if you don't have one at home, you have one on your phone. Another wonderful resource. Um, so today I um, had planned and still plan to talk about uh, where I am finding hope these days in this very challenging uh, world in which we are living in a tumultuous time in our country and throughout the world. And uh, I wanted to talk particularly about where I am finding hope through our outreach ministries here at the cathedral. Uh, we are devoting these old fashioned Sunday school classes throughout the month of July and on into August to on most Sundays featuring one of our particular outreach ministries, oftentimes one of our agencies in the community that we partner with, like those of you who were here last week know that uh, we had a presentation from Kat McAfee, who is the director of Lamastad, which is the uh, program uh, that uh, reaches out to Latino students across, uh, elementary students across the city of Atlanta and um, arranges partners with congregations like ours and other schools and organizations to provide after school tutoring and other enrichment programs for Latino students. Um, one of the big emphases of the program is helping students with homework and enrichment activities that they might not be able to get help with at home because while the students are usually pretty fluent in English, their parents often are not. So this is an incredibly important uh, ministry with which we are privileged to be involved. And uh, if you missed that, we hope to have Kat or some member of her staff back with us on August 11th for our annual ministry fair on Homecoming Sunday. But that's one example. Next week, we will be hearing from some wonderful folks, uh, parishioners and scholars, uh, students who are involved with our Cathedral Scholars Program. Um, and then the following Sunday, our own curate, uh, Salmoun Bashir, will be speaking about his work. Um, which is, uh, is very much a form of outreach. His work uh, 
with um, the, in the, the wider Episcopal Church as well as in this congregation on fostering ecumenical and interreligious dialogue again in this tumultuous time in our world. Uh, such a critical, such a vital ministry. And later on in August, we will hear um, from the interim director of Emmaus House, our own Joe Iorochi. And I see smiles from some of you who I know are uh, very actively involved with our ministries at Emmaus House. So um, we'll be focusing on outreach for the next uh, five to six weeks or so. So my plan today was to talk about outreach in general and where I find hope in our outreach ministries and hope in the work that this congregation is doing in the broader community. And I, I, I still want to do that, um, but we can, um, I'm going to, to veer from my script just a little bit um, because uh, we're, we're in a difficult time right now and I want to, to acknowledge that. Um, so again, it's good to be together. That's one of the, my themes for today, I think, is um, to quote uh, Psalm 133. Uh, those of you who went to Sewanee will recognize this passage, or if you, went, if you go like my son to Falling Creek Camp or had a, a son or grandson who went there, um, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, and so it's good to be here in the spirit of unity and Christian love today. Um, one other piece I want to say, um, you're all probably aware, I think of some of the transitions that we have had going on at the cathedral, and uh, it's come up uh, in, uh, in connection with, uh, with Lauren's leave taking and, and Kathy's, which will not occur until August, um, that both of them during their, their time here have sort of gotten to experience all different areas of ministry within the church uh, that it was for both of them who were ordained fairly recently before they arrived at the cathedral. Um, it has been something of a, of, of a training experience that I just want to say, because I was asked about this, as soon as I came on board as canon for mission, canon for outreach, several people said to me, well, we know how this works. Nobody really wants to do mission and outreach because there are so many challenges associated with it. So I guess we'll have you in that role for a year or so until you get to move on to something else. Well, I, I have been a priest for 25 years and I have experienced virtually all areas, all dimensions of, of parish ministry. It's true that there are some that I love, that I love especially, um, some that I've discovered are not my calling, I think. Um, but I love outreach and mission work. And I am not planning to move on from that position. I will remain as canon for mission and outreach. Well, <laughs> be careful what you pray for, right? But um, I, I love my work and I don't have a desire to move on from it. So I, I am so excited about what this parish has a long history of doing in the community and in the wider world. And I really look forward to seeing what we can do, what more we can do together and how we can be beacons of light and hope in this dark and troubled world. So thank you for, um, for the partnership that we share and for allowing me to be part of that with you. Um, maybe some of you have seen the meme that's been going around or Facebook post or social media post, and, and I tried to find it. I couldn't find it exactly, but I'll describe it. It's basically a meme um, that uh, shows someone looking sort of befuddled and distressed. Um, and the caption is uh, something about how hard it is to find the right balance these days between staying informed about what's going on all around us and retaining one's sanity. Um, and, you know, we, we laugh about that and I've laughed about it, but in, in many ways I find that, um, that balancing act to be very poignant and very difficult 
these days. Um, I am by nature something of a news junkie. I grew up with, uh, with a father who, uh, I grew up in Mississippi, so we were on central standard time and um, dinner had to be planned around the watching of my father's various evening news programs. Uh, back then the Menil Lara Report and uh, on Friday's Washington Week in Review and, and the dreaded, for my mother and me, the dreaded McLaughlin group because there was just constant shouting, shouting, shouting. But uh, our, our lives on weekday evenings revolved around these news programs. And so I come by naturally, my tendency to, um, as I'm making my morning coffee, to turn on the news on the radio or on the TV, to um, check throughout the day various websites to see what's going on. Um, but in the past several years, I, I found that I did have to um, set some limits there for my own protection, for the protection of my sense of well-being, um, for the protection of our children, uh, who I've realized, um, as, as they say, what is it, little dippers have big ears. And so, um, and I suspect a lot of us are kind of in this place of wondering how we can remain attentive in a responsible way that is indicative of our Christian calling, our baptismal calling, to be concerned about and deeply invested in the world around us, and it's particularly in the lives of those around us who are suffering, while not getting so mired down that we become so anxious or so angry or so unable to function that we aren't good for anyone, including ourselves or our own friends and family. Um, and so I've been hearing about this for a, from a lot of people. So I'm guessing, I mean, anyone else feeling this way? <laughs> yeah, probably a lot of us. So, so that's something I just wanted to, to note and to suggest some possibilities today of how we might pay attention in a way that, um, again, is responsive to our Christian calling, but that does not make any of us sick, quite literally, right? Um, but what is it, that, that book, The Body Keeps the Score? Yes. Um, and what feels especially heavy to me right now, and I want to hear from you all about this, is not just the extent of the suffering that's going on and the animosity that's going on, um, but also um, the extent of the helplessness that I think a lot of us, and that at least I know I feel oftentimes in terms of my capacity to make much of a difference um, in the face of these enormous and very complex um, situations, complex and complexity. Those are words I wanna, if, can somebody hold on to those words for me? Cause I wanna come back to them um, before the end of the, the time. Um, but uh, it's, it, it all feels so complex. What can I do? What can any of us do that can make any kind of difference? There's a sense, uh, at least again for me, in which it, it feels beyond me. Um, I know there are some things that I can do, but I, I wonder about the impact and wonder how I and all of us collectively can make more of an impact. So it's easy, at least for me, I think, in the midst of this dynamic to feel sort of paralyzed, to just freeze up. Um, I see some, some nods. It's easy just to check out completely. And I want to say, by the way, that I am a believer in periodic complete checkouts. Um, I, I do it. I think it's important for, for all of us to do it, whatever that may look like for you, whether it's um, like when, when our family takes a vacation, I check out completely from my emails and, and phone calls, voicemails here at the cathedral. Um, and last time we were on vacation, my husband and children also asked me to please check out from my news consumption. Um, and I did, and you know what? It was great. Um, and part of that, I think, was um, moving out of, some of you know that I'm a one on the Enneagram, and if you know the, the Enneagram, you know ones feel lots of responsibility to kind of hold the world up as if we were Atlas, uh, which 
nothing could be further from the truth, but we like to pretend that we are because it feeds our, our martyr complex. Uh, and we feel that if we don't take care of things that, that nobody else will and everything will just go to hell. Um, it's, a, it's a form of grandiosity uh, that has roots in childhood sort of neuroses, which I won't get into that now. But um, Jack and the children reminded me, you know, Julia, mom, you're really not as important as you think you are. And so this is a great, great reminder that I badly need to hear often. And they reminded me of that on the last vacation we were on. The world will, will go on. There are others who can do things in your absence. Um, so I'm a big believer in taking breaks, whether it's a, a periodic fast from the news or setting limits, you know, how much time you're going to spend watching. Um, a lot of people are getting into um, some, if not social media fast, at least sort of limiting and saying, I'm going to check in on social media during this hour each day. And then whenever I am tempted to get online or see something or, or, or just scroll and scroll and scroll, kind of doom scrolling is what they call it, I think, right now, um, to um, take a cue almost from a practice that some of you may have learned about your prayer lives, that um, if you are praying and you find yourself, as I sometimes do, thinking about my grocery list or how my children have no, no clean clothes to wear or something like that, we need not punish ourselves, but just um, notice the distraction, spiritual directors suggest, notice the distraction and then invite it to move on by. Yes, invite it to move on by. And so we can do the same, I think, for ourselves in taking these breaks and in checking out. Nonetheless, um, I don't think any of us wants to check out entirely first of all, because as I said, as part of our baptismal covenant, we have, we have taken um, <clears throat> vows to do things like respect the dignity of every human being, to, um, to love others, to, um, to reach out to those, especially those in need. And in our world, that invariably belong, uh, involves being aware of what's going on around us, uh, among our family and, and friends and our congregation and our city, in the world, our nation and, and the world. Um, so none of us, uh, I think, wants to check out or can afford to check out entirely. So what I'd like, as I said, to spend just a little bit of time um, focusing on, and this is my improvisation piece, uh, so we'll come back to, to more of what I had planned to say um, in just a few minutes. But um, what I had wanted to get towards today was um, some different ways in which we at the cathedral, I think, are gradually moving towards looking at outreach. And a couple of years ago, I did a, a, a class on this talking about how um, some of you may wonder, well, why is outreach a little different nowadays than it, it used to be? Um, particularly prior to COVID, uh, why are we doing things a little bit differently? We don't seem to have as many large group gatherings where we get together and um, assemble kits or do things like that, or where we go en masse out to agencies and work together. And um, I'm probably not gonna have time to get that to that today, but, uh, what I talked about during that session was uh, I suggested a couple of new directions that I think outreach at the cathedral and in congregations and in social service agencies and in general in our society, particularly post-COVID, have taken. And so one of those um, sort of paradigm shifts that I'll talk about in a minute is um, the concept of outreach as building relationships, um, being in relationship with people, not just doing something for somebody else, but coming into dialogue with, genuinely getting to know others and finding out how can we partner together? How can we be friends? Um, I'm not going to pretend that I know what you need in your life, your needs, may appear to me to be massive, but I couldn't begin to, to name them or to tell you the way you ought to address them. But I would love to listen to you and to hear your story and to hear your suffering and your pain and to hear what you need and how I or we might be partners 
in your healing and in your restitution and in your recovery um, in community. So that's one piece. The other paradigm that I already planned to talk about, and this is what I wanna focus on now, is the concept of outreach as a way of paying attention. Okay, some of you were um, in a book study I read during Lent, uh, a book study on a book by an, an author named D.L. Mayfield, who uh, the book is named um, The Myth of the American Dream. And D.L. Mayfield is um, a practicing Christian who has taken uh, upon herself to try to move into communities. She and her family have lived in communities on purpose that are very different from her own. And again, instead of using the paradigm of outreach that she learned growing up in her church was that here we are, good Christians, we're going to bring these sandwiches to you. Nothing wrong with sandwiches. I, we, we, we're gonna keep on making sandwiches for our friends at Church of the Common Ground. Please don't hear any of this as criticism. Um, but um, D.L. Mayfield, like a lot of us, grew up with the idea of outreach as basically, again, doing four. So making sandwiches and distributing them. Um, when you see uh, uh, an unhoused person on the street, um, to hand out money, whether they ask for money or, or not. So again, the concept of doing for without waiting to see what, for what a person might be asking. And so D.L. Mayfield in her early 20s set out on this sort of pilgrimage as it were to really become a true neighbor, to come into relationships with people living in vastly different situations from her own. And the reason she did this was that she wanted to become part of the community and to really be able to pay attention to and listen to and learn about the needs of others. So maybe someone did need a sandwich, but maybe what they needed more was help in going down to the local school board to get their child registered for for school in the fall, or maybe it was someone to take them to the DMV to get a driver's license, or maybe they didn't want anything to be done, but they were simply lonely and wanted someone to hear, really hear and respect their story. Um, perhaps they wanted, and, and D.L. Mayfield said this was one of the most challenging things for her, having grown up in a culture that says, you know, the. To whom much is given, much then is expected, right? Nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, again, growing up thinking of herself as someone who because of her privilege needed to do things for others and give things to others and teach others. Uh, and she actually did spend a lot of time teaching English as a second language. Um, but in living in community, particularly in refugee communities, she found that um, a lot of what was desired was some people in these communities wanted to give something to her. And that initially it was incredibly hard for her, for example, to take you know, a large plate of food from a family that she knew had limited food in their household, but had prepared a meal for her, an extra to take home to her own family. And that was incredibly hard. Um, but the main thing D.L. Mayfield says she learned from, um, and she still lives uh, in, in, refugee, in a refugee community um, out in the Pacific Northwest, um, she learned a different way of paying attention. Again, not coming at it from the perspective of, I know what the norm is, I know what works, I'm going to tell you what you need to do to make progress, but rather, let me listen to you. Tell me about your experience. Tell me about what's going on with you, and let's be in partnership together. And um, as I was thinking about this, this, this concept of outreach as, as paying attention, as um, going out into the world, and not immediately rushing 
in our very Western way, right, to do things. And I'm, I'm so guilty of this. I mean, I, I, I tell you, one of the, the great things that my dear colleague, Kathy Zappa, has taught me in her uh, work as canon for pastoral care is, um, it, it's sort of a, a paraphrase of, I don't think it was J Yogi Berra who said this, although it sounds like something that Yogi Berra might, might say, that there are so many times in life when we would do well to, um, don't just do something, stand there. That oftentimes, especially those of us who are in caregiving roles, either professionally or in our families or who come by that naturally, that um, in times of stress and crisis, whether it's in a family with a neighbor or in our country, we immediately go running out. You know, we, we're the, the folks who run towards the fire and, and see if we can help the firefighters, you know, get the, get the water going and, and see, here, let me hold that enormous, um, you know, hose. <laughs> and, and then we're, you know, up in the air and 20 feet and in the hospital ourselves. Um, so, um, but that's kind of our societal paradigm, I think, rush in and, and do something. And Kathy has taught me so much about, uh, in the way she approaches ministry, so much of um, the importance of simply being present and of observing and paying attention before we rush in. And that sometimes just the paying attention and the noticing, um, what's going on here? Where might I help? Perhaps I might help most by going home and going by in a couple of weeks when others have forgotten the need. Um, and so outreach is paying attention, which to me means sort of standing back for a bit, not in a disengaged, disconnected way, but standing back um, with humility to see and to ask ourselves what's going on here in whatever the situation is, whether it's a pastoral concern or a, a neighbor who's going through a difficult time or um, uh, uh, panic in our country and in the wider world. Um, what's going on and how might I use my gifts? First getting in touch with what some of our gifts are uh, but then asking, is there a way that I might be able to help here? Is there someone who is going through a struggle that I could find out from them, that I could spend a little bit of time observing and finding out, how can I help? Um, so taking time to observe and pay attention, and I have learned that this is especially important um, in our work here at the cathedral with communities where there is um, great economic disparity between another com community and our community here at the Cathedral of St. Philip, where there um, are different cultural differences oftentimes that it can be um, extremely offensive and off-putting for us to just rush in again with our own ideas about how to fix something. And so the ministry of paying attention and thinking of outreach and reaching out to others as first paying attention and perhaps standing back and listening before we act, um, I think is so important, particularly as we see in our country and around the world, the increasing frenzy which is the way we, most of us naturally, right? Respond to crisis and chaos. It doesn't feel good. Um, and uh, so a lot of us wanna go into action, but taking time to pay attention and to listen. Um, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Ah, I know. Um, I, again, to draw on D.H. Uh, D.L. Mayfield's book, um, The Myth of the American Dream, she uh, gives a, a wonderful, many beautiful examples in that book, but one that has really stuck out for me was a time when she knew the family next door, a refugee family, were going through a hard time, and so she wanted to kind of appear with a casserole or whatever. But instead, her neighbor asked her if she would simply take a little while to sit on the stoop outside and eat some cherries with her. The neighbor had, had found or had been gifted or had gotten some, some fresh cherries. And at first, Dia Mayfield thought, uh, no, I can't, 
they're, they're yours, you have so little. But the neighbor persisted, and so they had a sort of communion, she said, um, eating cherries together and sharing stories, and she went away with a better sense of how she could be a true neighbor to this individual. Um, so a question that I would, would raise for us today as we think about outreach, about reaching out to one another and to others beyond this cathedral in these uh, very complex and tumultual times would be the simple question for each of us maybe to ask ourselves sometime today or in the next week, um, with whom could I eat some cherries? With whom could I eat some cherries? Is there someone um, in my life that perhaps I've been thinking of as, oh, I, I need to go and help them. But perhaps um, I could simply go and we could eat some cherries and perhaps they have something to offer me that would nurture me in this difficult time. Um, so with whom could I eat some cherries? With whom could we as a congregation eat some cherries? Outreach is as paying attention, taking stock, looking, listening, using our senses before we rush right in, in a world where so many are rushing in um, constantly, sometimes with um, the effect that the chaos grows greater, right? Any, I'd love to hear, I'm gonna stop for a minute there and then we'll move on, but any reflections on is this a, a new sort of a concept or has anyone had an experience perhaps similar to uh, the experience of sitting down and eating cherries with a, with a neighbor whom you have thought of perhaps as a charity case before? But Jeff, yes. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's not at all an uncommon experience at the annual Requiem for the Homeless uh, here at the cathedral and elsewhere in, in other ministries. And, and I do feel like, um, again, that, that that is a place where I am finding hope these days in sort of letting myself off the hook is not quite the right um, phrase, I think, but in the way it is, because I can feel my whole body and my spirit relax as I take myself off the hook, again, from having to fix everything for other people and to begin to think of my ministry more as simply a ministry of presence, a ministry of paying attention, a ministry of listening. And I'll give you an example um, from my family and our true life uh, the other day. And I, I say this, um, always conscious as a one that I'm gonna come off self-righteously and this is not what I'm intending. But uh, the children and I were down visiting the world of Coca-Cola um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there was a, a, a man who was standing, he was holding up a sign um, asking for assistance when we were stopped at a, a red light. Um, and uh, I thought to myself, I never carry cash anymore. And, um, but I thought I'm, I'm going to take a cue from DL Mayfield and I'm just gonna roll down my window and I'm gonna say hello to this, to this man and to ask him what he's doing and what's going on. Um, and he did indeed ask if I had any money and I said, I'm so sorry, I don't. Um, but is there anything else that would be helpful to you and he, he said, would you pray for me? And um, he may admit, you know, at another time, but we were stuck in Atlanta traffic. So there was plenty of time, even one of my long Presbyterian prayers. I mean, we had, we had a lot of time. So, I mean, we covered the gamut. Um, and so I, I reached out and took his hand and we, and we prayed together. Um, and that was a different sort of an experience for me because 
for the first time in a long time, I didn't have a sense of guilt or inadequacy when I went away about not having had a card with the number to the nearest shelter, if he had even wanted to go to a shelter, or not having you know, $5 to give him, or even a water bottle. He asked for water. We didn't have that either. Um, so it was just a new sort of experience. Um, so being open to different ways of reaching out. Yes. Hmm. Or pressed it. I shouldn't have said rolled it. Oh, yeah, right, right. I've, I've just dated myself. Yeah. I pressed the button. I still remember in the late 70s when I was a small child, my grandparents had gotten, this is off the topic, but you know the way I do. Um, no, 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 it's good. No. Yeah. Ah. Uh, I have very dear friends over at the other cathedral mm -hmm. across the demarcation line here. And they had a child that was making their first communion, uh -huh. a grandchild, and they didn't know where to go to get anything for this first communion. I said, well, go to the cathedral bookstore. Well, where is that? They go to church across the street and did not even know that we have this wonderful bookstore uh -huh. here. So I offer that as, as a place to come eat cherries. Yes, I love that. Thank you. The Cathedral Bookstore as a place to come eat cherries. Yes, because, you know, we are really the only um, independent um, faith-based bookstore that I'm aware of in Atlanta now. So we have folks from all different walks of life and all different denominations and traditions coming to us. So it is. It's a wonderful place to come eat cherries and to learn about other people um, and to, to pay attention to what's going on in others' lives. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, wonderful. Diane and then John, yes. So when going back to the um, homeless requiem, there was a man in tears as I was gonna go into the service. So we went and sat down in the chapel and, and he talked through about half of the service. Mm. And he told me what it was really like mm. to be out there on the street. And of course, I, I wanna do something. And I, you know, and, but he's telling me things we don't think about like, um, like, he knew a woman who was homeless, but she didn't want her son to know. And so she, she bought him an iPad and mm -hmm. he didn't know she was homeless. And she, you know, to hide that. And he talked about trying to defend women on the street mm -hmm. from being attacked. All kind of things that you never think about, you know, and um, so we, we we're gonna go into the service and it was about half over, but we, you know, and, but he said, well, is she gonna preach or what? And I said, well, I already did. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, that's okay. We just had our own, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, but, that's, but, that's... you know, and sitting at the table that night, people told me things like, there was a young man who had come to Atlanta from, uh, somewhere up north, and he had a job, but he worked at night, and so he can't be in a shelter because they won't let him in around his work times. Things that, again, you don't think about. Um, there was a lady who wouldn't tell me her name, and, you know, we tried to and I, I wondered about that, and then I thought, well, does she get in trouble? If someone knows, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. government agencies, what is it? And she could have been mentally ill, I couldn't tell, but there's all these things. Mm -hmm. that there, there are all these things. <laughs> that you don't and, think about. <laughs> and, and, and this significant, 
that you were there to pay attention and to listen. Absolutely, yes, let's see, um, John. Oh, thank you, thank you, Joseph. See, I was trying to overfunction once more. <laughs> I'm gonna pay Thanks. attention. I, I would just like to emphasize the importance of relationships, which you mentioned earlier. And um, seven years ago, Kathy Zappa asked me if I would chair a committee to explore uh, ways of expanding our ministry to the uh, women at Arendelle State Prison. And so we started working uh, to see what that might look like. And we came up with this great plan of you know, how we were gonna pair with the women who were coming out of prison. We were gonna get referrals from the chaplain there. And we had this handbook that you know, laid out all of the ways in which we, we could uh, function and help people and the boundaries and so forth. And we tried it with a couple of women and it just didn't work. And what we realized was that we had no relationship with these women. Mm -hmm. We, so, you know, we decided to go inside the prison and develop relationships with these people, you know, and that was what really worked. And, you know, now we go up uh, regularly and the women know me as Mr. John. And, you know, I got fussed at by a guard for hugging one of the women this week. Mm -hmm. We routinely, during our, uh, our worship service, we hug the women, but the guards aren't around, so they're not there to fuss at us. <laughs> but the women trust us. We have a great relationship with them, and they tell us what their issues are so we can pray for them and yes. help, them, yes. help them find housing, help them find jobs, and so forth. So. That is, thank you so much for John, uh, John for that, because that, that is, I, I am finding hope these days in the small ministries of paying attention and to building relationships where and when I can. And that is something which you and others who have been ministering at Arendelle, I think, have done so beautifully so that you are aware, and this was actually, I had some little sort of glimmers of where I was, specific examples of where I was finding hope recently. One of those I wanted to mention was um, that just recently the cathedral had the opportunity because John was listening and paying attention to the needs of the women at Arendelle and came to found that they love the um, popular devotional Jesus Calling. And so uh, John approached me and said, can we buy them some more of these because theirs are, are falling apart because they've read them so much. And so we were able to do that. And that felt to me like a glimmer of hope. No, we didn't overhaul the prison system. No, we didn't get parole for women who really frankly deserve it, for women some of whom are sick and dying and need to be able to go home. But we brought a modicum of comfort through relationships. See, that is, that is hope for me. That is hope for me. Yes, I saw a hand back here. Oh, uh, several hands. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, hi, this, just to kind of tap into what you brought up at the beginning about hope and finding for me, just my takeaway in listening is about finding hope in the hopelessness right now because mm -hmm. there is so much hopelessness. And so it mm -hmm. starts with me and taking a step back in the pause and I too am somebody that wants to go out in the middle of the street and help the firefighter. You know, let me hold the water hose for you. And I do have to take a step back. And that, um, and I think for me, when I moved to Atlanta, I needed to find a way to connect. And I got involved with, with a, another homeless thing, but our, our church is very involved with our ministry. And I think it's really in what's already been spoken about, it's in the listening. St. Veronica, as we were talking about, you know, how things changed with COVID and giving our supplies and how we accumulate our supplies to give to our charities, rather than somebody just saying, well, here's the Amazon account, let's order this in bulk and order this in bulk and order this in bulk, we actually asked them what they needed. And I think that's the key. You know, for me, seeing the same lady on Peachtree that's wheeling her wagon and making trash bags into a dress, I need to go up and ask her, what, what do you need today? rather than going in somewhere and giving her mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, cash or, or a, a gift card. Well, how, does she, how do I know she even knows how to use that? Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. no clue. Mm -hmm. 
And the other thing that we had here was the Braver Angels, mm -hmm. too. Yes. About sitting down, George was d doing that, sitting down and listening to people on the other side of the political spectrum and taking us a pause and sitting and listening to their humanity. Mm -hmm. And I know any change has got to yes. begin with me. So thanks. Listening to one another's humanity, absolutely. And I think I uh, saw a hand back here somewhere. Yes. Um, I just had a, an experience that I wanted to share. When I was teaching, we had a philanthropy class and we took high school seniors uh, around different places in Atlanta. And there were a couple of things that really stood out. One was focused community strategies where Jim Wainer says, we don't do anything in the community until we have lived there for mm. six months and people begin to trust us, and mm. then we can make some inroads. But wow. my favorite, one of my favorite things that happened was when we took our high school seniors, I guess there were about 20 of them, um, to Drew Charter School for a day to spend with the children. And what we did was make sandwiches to take to the high rise, for the elderly, mm -hmm. which, which wasn't very far away. Mm -hmm. And the kids loved it. They mm -hmm. were always on the receiving end. Ah, they were yes. not ever yeah. on the giving end of right. it. And they were adorable. I mean, they were so busy ah. making sandwiches, but then they were so sweet with their um, almost like grandparents. It was ah. a, a really touching Thank, situation. That is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. But I think that it's important to, to find out where the needs are. And I hear what you're saying about making connections. But one of the best things, places where we got advice was just from the Community Foundation mm -hmm. to where's the research, what works, mm -hmm. and what are the needs. Mm -hmm. and, and we were just looking in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a lot of research about what does work and what does not work. Absolutely. There and is. Mm -hmm. where are the specific needs in Atlanta? Mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right about that. And just, uh, I know we need to, to stop in just a minute, but um, that is actually ties in with, with one or two other things I just wanted to say in, in closing. And as usual, when I go off script, anyway. You know, it was more important that we were together and that we have shared than any agenda I had. Um, so, um, yes, coming into a community first. Uh, so that is one of the things that we are seeking. If you are looking, and I have lots of ideas and suggestions and um, ways I could point you if you are looking for a way perhaps to enter into a new community and to start forming some, some relationships. Many of you already have those places and know far better than I do where you are, are, are called. And I wouldn't presume to tell you that, but I'd be happy to explore it with you and uh, have dialogue with you about that if you're, if you're interested. But uh, one of the um, places some of you know where we have been working to increase our listening and attentive presence is with, um, uh, Parish Grove, the community formerly known as Cathedral Towers, and uh, particularly our St. Anne's Guild uh, has undertaken a ministry of presence there and of listening and finding out how can we be better friends and neighbors to one another. Um, so, and that's an example of, of a way I think in which a group from this parish has gone into and very powerfully um, waited and listened and tried to hear and gone to be a part of that community before rushing in with an agenda. Um, and in a related piece, the discernment piece I, you were speaking about in terms of looking at what's been tried and what helps and different studies and where the needs are greatest, um, this is going to be a part of the extremely exciting and um, I pray incredibly significant work I think we're going to be able to do here at the cathedral with what we are establishing as the Cathedral Towers Fund. These will be all the proceeds that we 
we have gotten from the closing of the transaction with National Church Residences, the 99-year lease that most of you are probably aware of um, that uh, National Church Residences has, has taken on and that we are receiving um, monies for this that will all go into the new Cathedral Towers Fund to be used exclusively to discern and then to get involved in ways to produce um, and to partner with those producing more affordable housing, particularly for seniors in this community and beyond. And that is going to, first of all, involve a huge listening process and speaking with experts and partners within the community, because that's, that's critical. We're not going to be rushing into that. In fact, the plan is to um, engage in about a year-long process of discernment before we start um, start uh, tapping into those funds to, to work to do what we can to help with the crisis of affordable housing in Atlanta and beyond. So, yeah. yeah. All right, well, I think we are about, um, so I'm finding hope in paying attention. I'm finding hope in trying to listen better and in building relationships. I'm finding hope in all of you and the many ministries and the relationship building and the listening and paying attention um, that you are uh, involved in. I am paying attention a lot more to what uh, I think pop culture now is calling glimmers. Have you all heard about glimmers? These are in contrast to triggers that you've heard about. Um, you know, going on social media or listening to the news and being triggered by something that, that wells up enormous anger or anxiety within you. Um, I have been seeing a lot of people, um, including uh, psychologists, suggesting that we pay the same amount of time to glimmers, that is glimmers of hope, glimmers of goodness in our midst, and, and giving those at least as much energy, if not more, than we do the anxieties, the anger, the frustration, the sense of, of helplessness, and that is another way of paying attention. Um, seeing someone helping someone at the grocery store, uh, being aware of a friend who has been caring for an elderly parent for a long time, um, seeing um, two people hugging on the street, uh, learning about organizations in our own community and beyond that are making a difference. Uh, even just uh, visiting our cathedral website, and I, I want us to work on the outreach and missions page. It's not yet where I'd hope it to will be eventually, but uh, going on there and reading about the work that some of these, our partner agencies are doing in our community and beyond, and uh, really paying attention to and focusing on that and asking yourself, could I get involved there possibly? So focusing on those glimmers. All right, well, I think there's probably a glimmer of hope in the uh, vesting room right now that I'm gonna leave and show up uh, for the next service. Um, <coughs> so why don't we uh, end by uh, standing if we're able and saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right.